901, so I'm going to start, <laughs> even though we don't have someone. Yeah. And we'll maybe just uh, do some uh, introductions, and I get a sense of what you guys know and, we're, and what you're interested in. Um, so I'm John Pierre Le Jacques. Um, I've been uh, programming in C and C++ for quite a long time. So this is more. Uh, this presentation is more lessons learned. It's, uh, there's not a lot of original research here. <laughs> it's mainly just uh, lessons learned uh, over the years of development. Uh, so folks, the folks that are here, uh, who is using C now? Uh, is it in, are you doing it for embedded applications or performance reasons? Oh. Do you do C++ as well, or strictly C? <laughs> <laughs> and C++. Um, I, I usually do a combination of the two, C and C++. Uh, uh, I've developed uh, software for just about anything you can think of, uh, embedded to defense systems, uh, where performance mattered a lot, where it didn't matter so much, uh, kernels and kernel-based development, so a whole range of things. Uh, what, what are you folks interested primarily in, and uh, is there a particular topic you want to try to get in? So, as I go along, okay. So, if as I go along, just jump in at any point and, and ask questions. So I'd like to be interactive if we can. Uh, again, the disclaimer: this is fairly. So, uh, so uh, again, the disclaimer: this is fairly opinionated point of view. <laughs> So uh, there's not a lot of original research to back up some of the claims here. I'd be interested to see what everybody else's uh, opinions of some of these things are. Um, so we're going to uh, mainly explore what I've observed in real production environments, uh, both open source and commercial. Um, I'm going to try to talk about common patterns that people uh, like to use that are actually effective, and then the inverse, the anti patterns hopefully everyone's heard of that term, uh, common things that are advocated that are actually harmful for most uh, applications. Uh, just a little bit about me, I'm one of the founders of Coin Inc. It's a software consultancy. We got headquarters in Davidson and uh, Boston in Nicaragua. Uh, we've been doing, well, I've been doing uh, this for a very long time, uh, primarily in Unix uh, systems, all types of Unix systems, and Linux uh, more, uh, more frequently nowadays. Uh, and I contribute to a lot of different open source projects. Uh, Debian, I was a Debian maintainer. I'm trying to get back in. If there are any Debian maintainers, I'd love to get my key signed. <laughs> Uh, so what makes C different and why do people use C? Um, so uh, first, uh, what makes C different and why do people use C? Because there, there are a lot of ports on it, and, and you know it, there are a lot of alternative language. Every day there's a new language. And that's true for uh, things that C is specifically targeted to. Uh, so compiled languages that are meant to have high performance, things like Rust uh, is probably the one most folks have heard of. Um, so, so the big things about C is you get direct access to hardware that's one. So when you're writing embedded applications, C is a kind of natural choice. High performance also. Uh, uh, nowadays, uh, you can argue that C++ may be as good, if not better, in certain application areas for performance. But when you really, really need to get high performance, C is right before assembler. Um, the one thing that's uh, maybe counterintuitive or a, or a heresy in some <laughs> places is if you need to write high reliability applications that have good performance, what are your choices um, there? And one advantage of C, ironically, is that it has pretty good type checking capability that can be ver and can verify or eliminate a whole class of errors that you just can't in other languages. Um, and we're going to emphasize that a lot. You're going to see uh, trying to take advantage of that uh, in the future. Um, and then the other thing that's very attractive, uh, so for example, the Linux kernel community emphasizes this a lot. 
Uh, they like C, they dislike C++ because too much magic happens in C++. You look at a piece of code and a gazillion things could be executed. Uh, C is not like that. You, you see a line of code, you know what it's doing. Uh, now, you can bend the rules, you, you can have grindings of functions and all kinds of craziness, but for the most part, uh, it's pretty transparent what's going on in C. And when you're maintaining a large code base, that's a, that's a, a really big advantage. Um, so I'm going to go through some process issues first, just things that are um, issues that come up with any language, honestly. It's not specifically C. And a lot of this is uh, gleaned from commercial development in a lot of ways. Um, so uh, at the top level, a lot of uh, commercial companies, for the most part, uh, agonize about what methodology we're going to use, and it's constantly changing. Every every couple of years, there's a new methodology. I found almost no difference among them. Even it can be successful with Waterfall, it can have a disaster with Agile. Um, and so I don't see much difference in them, honestly. Uh, same with tools. P uh, companies tend to agonize around tool selection. Uh, and they're constantly switching out their issue tracking system or their, or their bug tracking uh, system or, or their um, documentation. Uh, again, they're all basically the same. I don't see a whole lot of difference and they don't add a significant value one over the other. Um, uh, even, uh, even, and this might be a little more controversial, even source control systems, um, you can be effective with any of them. Um, so a good example of that is Debian. Uh, any of you Debian developers, maintainers, who use Debian? Have you ever had to use their defect tracking system? And, right? So their defect tracking system, which has been around a long, long time, incredibly effective, doesn't have a web interface. You use it through mail, email. That's it. Uh, works works great. People, it works very well. Every so often, someone comes up and says, "Oh, we should switch to Jira." Why not use Jira? And uh, there's so little value in doing that that it's not hard work. It. And then the thing that I hate the most is the Gartner reports. Uh, here is the new tool. Uh, it's in the upper right quadrant. Everyone should switch to that tool, uh, and with very little to back it up. But does work is. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot more about the different techniques to try to get high reliability. Is you got to have leads and management that really advocate for what matters. And if that if that isn't there, it's very hard to make uh, significant uh, improvements in your quality and security uh, profiles. That's probably obvious, but uh, just to state state the obvious. Uh, another thing I see, uh, this again is more in the commercial realm than the open source, uh, open software uh, realm, is there's a lot of reliance on high level architectures to solve everything. So, you know, at one, at one point it was client server, then it was uh, web services, and it keeps changing over and over again. And there's not enough emphasis on lower level design. Uh, problems. This is uh, the lower level detail design is super important in C. You can hurt yourself so badly in that language by not understanding uh, features and uh, strengths and weaknesses of C. Uh, the other thing, in, in again, uh, our, unfortunately, our industry is fairly faddish. So there's constantly new, quote unquote, new stuff coming out all the time. Uh, essentially, I don't think much has changed since Dijkstra started doing all his uh, ADTs uh, and uh, structured programming. It's all basically the same. Um, so uh, probably uh, the folks in the that are using C++ have you started using continuations yet? Yeah, that's a new. Uh, that's a new. Mechanism for implementing um, uh, an alternative to threading. Uh, it's been around since LISP for essentially forever. 
and again, it's considered a brand new thing. <laughs> again, not really. This is the most controversial slide. Uh, probably this is the most controversial slide <laughs> um, testing. So you probably all read the trade rags and books and saying how important testing is in our lead of testing and unit testing in particular. I completely agree. However, I've had very little success in commercial enterprises of having testing adopted, unit level testing. They always rely on manual testing with a separate team. Um, it's incredibly expensive um, and, and very ineffective for the most part. Uh, the only exception to this rule is when I did work in the defense industry. They, are the, they take it very, very seriously. Uh, all the other industries, I'm not very impressed. Um, uh, so, let's say that's an anti-pattern, emphasizing testing a lot. However, you really do need to do it. It's really a question of how do you get it into your enterprise and, and make it effective. The, probably the most important, um, uh, and just, just uh, as examples of some more, some more stories here, I've seen uh, very large code bases that initially had the right intention, they wrote very good quality tests, had fairly good code coverage, and two, three years later, the majority of the tests are commented on. Because the solution for a test failing is, am I going to spend some more time fixing the issue, or am I just going to comment it out? And unfortunately, uh, it often happens that people just comment out the tests. Uh, and I see this both in commercial and unfortunately in open source software. So I, I help, um, I submit a lot of patches to Giving Make Make as an example. Uh, has anyone looked at the source code for Giving Make? And so they actually have a fairly extensive test suite, but for years it was not executable, completely un unused and languishing for a good 10 years. Now they've brought it back up. It's and think of how important the GNU Make is to the open source uh, community. To think that that did not have an adequate test suite is, is really astonishing. Um, as, a, as a counter to this, and, and what I'm going to be promoting a lot in this slide, is uh, reliance on static analysis, uh, both the, taking advantage of the language features as well as a tool that's now available. Uh, there, you don't have to write any code, any special code. Uh, you don't have to um, uh, browbeat people to run their tests. If you're going to compile the project, you have to pass a static analysis. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, documentation is another uh, issue that comes up. Um, I've seen both ends of the spectrum where you have waterfall or um, SDLC types of uh, development processes that have very detailed uh, documents. They have 50 different document types. What, um, they spend a lot of money putting them together and then they often uh, either bit rot or get lost in the SharePoint uh, world <laughs> or, uh, or they're never updated. Uh, even when you have pretty good documentation, my, my uh, unfortunate uh, experience is, is that people rarely read them either way. It's only as a last resort kind of thing. People read code, developers read code, um, much less uh, actual documentation. What, what I strongly recommend here is keeping the documentation alongside the code and the version control. And fortunately, the open source community has been very good at doing that. And, um, and then the other part is document within the code itself. So tools like Doxygen, everyone uses Doxygen. You should, if, if no one's using, not using it yet. That's, that's your best chance of having, um, having decent documentation of the API. Is it like documentation by comments or something? It's uh, essentially uh, uh, annotated comments. 
that uh, are parsed along during the compile phase, and you can generate HTML or, or uh, any number of different formats. I'll, I'll show some examples of that. Uh, continuous integration, probably everyone realizes. Everyone uses CI? Yeah, okay, um, the, uh, I, I think that's a great idea. The basic idea behind continuous integration is you're constantly building your applications to uh, identify a compiler and ideally test failures as soon as possible. Um, I, I've had very good success both in commercial and open source projects on uh, using CI. The, the only thing I would uh, warn about is often it's kind of a two-edged spectrum. In one way, they don't use it enough. We should be using CI to have various, uh, test various types of variant builds as well as different platforms. So a, an example of what I uh, highly recommend is always target the next environment that you're going to deploy on. So you have your current production environment, say you're on Linux uh, 4.5, the current, that kernel, and uh, GCC uh, 6. You should also be compiling with the current 5 and GCC 9. Just so you're ready, and, and maybe more importantly, you can take advantage of all the added uh, functionality that GCC 9 provides, which is astonishingly better than 6. Um, next, a uh, quick thing is on standards. We're going to talk a little bit more in detail on C standards here. Uh, a common thing I see in the, more in the commercial space, but honestly a little bit in the open source uh, world too, is that you don't really need them. Uh, people already know how to program in C. Why do I need to develop a coding guideline for a C program? Uh, so do you guys have a coding guideline for your job? Or? Okay, some do. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is problematic is the inverse, saying, well, we need a coding guideline, let me start one from scratch. So it's like, uh, it's like companies that want to write their own crypto software. I think that's a really bad idea. <laughs> uh, to go look for what's out there. And fortunately, uh, there are some excellent guidelines, secu security-related guidelines available. Uh, many free, and uh, you shouldn't be using that. Or start use those as starting points. The the other thing is, it's really important if you have large teams, uh, you can't assume anyone's going to read your guidelines. They won't. They, they simply won't do it. Uh, the only place I see guidelines really effective is when you're doing code reviews, or you're saying why the static analysis tool is rejecting your code. You can go and say. Look at the CERT uh, guidelines on initialization in number 5.4, and then they, they'll read it at that point and figure out what, what they're doing wrong. Uh, the problem is, is you don't want to constantly get into arguments with C about, oh, this is good code, or that, I've been coding this way for 10 years, and this is the right way to do it, versus another one saying, no, no, don't do it that way, that way it's in memory weeks. Whatever. You want to have uh, an authoritative source that you can go to. Okay, so kind of high-level issues, uh, okay, so high level issues uh, affects any language. I haven't seen much difference. I've programmed in a whole bunch of languages. All those kind of issues come up no matter what language. So I'm going to dive down into uh, C-specific things now. And here's a, here's a list of things I'm going to try to cover. Um, first, what what C are you going to use? So do you, do you guys program to C11? Anyone program to C11? Do people know that C18 is out? No. Do you know what's in C20, 2x? No. Most people, C programmers I see, are barely up to C89. And they're still, so for example, um, can you declare, where can you declare variables in a function? 
That's right. Exactly. Since C89, you've been able to mix your declaration. The vast majority of C code I see still tacks on all the variables at the very top. Uh, why, why is that a problem? Well, you're increasing the scope of the, of the variables unnecessarily, and you can't initialize them to a sensible value. So everything gets initialized to zero or no. Right? Or I, I'd like to initialize my pointers to uh, AIX uses dead beef as the hex value. Um, so um, in, in some ways, uh, C has gone trapped into one of the nice things about C that it's a it's a, um, a stable language that people know and that it is available on any platform you can think of. And they think, well, to maximize that, I will uh, stick to KNR or C89. Um, I think that's changed now. You can get GCC or Clang on just about anything. And if your vendor doesn't support this uh, more modern variants to C, uh, just switch to those and tell them I'm going to switch unless you make make the thing. Now I know I know there are good reasons to have backward compatibility to older languages, but uh, really think about can I take advantage of some of the new language features? So just to go through the list. So what does C99 add? Um, inline functions. Do you use macros for, do you use function macros? Folks, and do you use it for performance reasons? There's no good reason to do that anymore. You get complete type checking with inline functions. Been available forever um, since, since it, 99. Uh, so how many years now? 19, 20 years? It, it's about, let's, let's start using inline functions. Um, you can intermingle declarations and code, a uh, whole bunch of new types, bool, finally, we have a bool, <laughs> so we, we don't have to be embarrassed using C. Um, we now have, if you need to write highly portable code, don't invent your own type defs for different size of integers. Uh, there's a standard for those. Um, people familiar with the restrict qualifier? <coughs> One. Uh, the high performance guys that don't use restrict. If you don't, you should be. Uh, that's, uh, what that does, it determines the aliasing of pointers. And that makes a, a tremendous, uh, really a tremendous difference in performance for high performance computing, especially engineering scientific. That's a one big advantage Fortran has about over C, is that everything is on alias in Fortran. In C, you have to, by default, assume everything is alias, so you can't make uh, certain optimizations. It's been available for a long time. The C library is fully constant restrict safe. The POSIX library is almost fully positive, uh, constant restrict safe. Um, you, you can write code. It's not that hard. You know, look, there are a lot of guidelines that say restrict is too complicated, but if you're using C, you can figure out restrict. Uh, anyone know? Can you can you declare a function where you can ensure that you have at least a certain number of, of elements in an array? Uh, people know that syntax. No? Okay. Let me show you what you've been missing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump around and code. So. Uh, here's a little fun. Can, can, is that readable to me? No. Okay. Um, the, uh, accumulate is a function that takes uh, uh, an array of unsigned. And I want to ensure that I get a certain number, at least five elements in the array. Um, the syntax to do that is you declare the, inside the square brace, you use a standard keyword and then the size, that ha the minimum size that it has to have. The compiler would then check 
that you're not passing a pointer, you're actually passing an array, and the array at least has at least five elements. No, no one. I've never Anyone seen ever use that? Code with no. no, no one. I've never seen real code with this, <laughs> though it's been around since, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, I, just, I just simply don't understand why this isn't used. This would eliminate a major source of of um, balance errors, uh, uh, security-related buffer overflows, just by this simple thing, and it's caught at compile time, not at runtime. I think so. I think so. Or I think so. I think so. Or we have to have more presentations like this. Or I, I don't know what it takes to to do. Now there is one disadvantage to this, uh, and I sometimes don't use it uh, for this. This is not in the C the C plus plus language. So this is one of the incompatibilities, and there are not many, but this is one of the incompatibilities between C and C plus plus. It will fail. This is not legal syntax in C++. So let me show you what the compiler will do. So um, I'm going to use Clang. You can use GCC. I just Okay, so um, I'm just going to run through these options. I'm going to go into this a little bit more. Um, Clang understands, uh, actually it calls it C17, C17 instead of C18. Clang implements C18 uh, now. Uh, so there is no reason not to start using some of these features. Uh, Clang has incredible static analysis. I'm going to turn all of them on with the everything. Um, to get maximal coverage of the static analysis, you have to use optimization. That enables flow control, um, uh, uh, path flow analysis. I'm also going to enable the address and undefined sanitizers. People use the sanitizers. Really helpful. No, no one's used them. People use Valve Some, some folks. Uh, the sanitizers or Valve Rhymes on steroids. Uh, so, for example, Valve Rhyme can only check dynamic memory errors. The address sanitizer checks any kind of memory error. So, stack, uh, stack based uh, variables, arrays that you overflow, uh, this will catch them. I have a uh, claim 7, I think, installed here. Okay, so let me clean that up so you can see it. Okay, so I'm going to get a warning from this. Okay, so I'm going to get a warning from this. Cauli requires at least five elements, so I passed in an array that was too small. So that was uh, line 41. So here, here I have an array that's too small. So here, here I have an array that's too small, just right, uh, not really too big, it's, it's big. Um, an array that's bigger than the minimum is fine, you can pass that in. And I got a standard check of too small, eliminated a buffer overrun at compile time. And this is the point I want to try okay. to make. So, and, and this is the point I want to try to make is C has evolved, and where it's evolving is to get more and more type checking enabled at compile time in the language, both for performance reasons and for correctness and security uh, reasons. Uh, C11 added a whole slew of new features. Uh, people are familiar with the assert feature from KR. Uh, people use the static assert. Okay, so static assert was adopted from C++. It's a compile time assertion of something. So, for example, if you want to guarantee 
that your unsigned is a certain number of bits. You can do that at compile time, not at runtime. They have. Oh, there's multi-threaded support. So we now have standard uh, cross-platform threading available. You don't have to rely on POSIX threads on one, for one platform and Windows threads on another platform. You, you now have a consistent uh, threading library. Uh, people familiar with uh, templates in C++? C++ has templates for many, many years. C++ has had templates for many, many years, almost from the beginning. C now has something almost equivalent, and they call them generic functions. And it's a general mechanism where you can have function overloading. So you may have seen in the C99 library that you have POW for longs, doubles, and, and different kinds of floating point types. Oh, but they're named the same. Before, you had to have a PAL-L, a PAL-D, a PAL-LD. You don't have to do that anymore. So you have the equivalent of function overloading in C. This is a feature that's available for you, not just the standard library. Uh, for the performance-related folks or the embedded system, there is now a standard way of specifying memory alignment. Uh, again, this is a gigantic win. You always had a whole bunch of ugly hacks that each compiler vendor provided. Now there's a nice standard way of doing that. Um, there's also uh, a function specifier. Uh, no return is the most important one. They're starting to, imp they started even at this point to implement the concept of attributes. Are folks familiar with GCC attributes? So these are declarations that GCC and has been adopted by almost all the compilers. Microsoft has something equivalent um, that's, uh, that you can say in your code uh, something about a function or type. So in a simple example in GCC, you can say a pointer parameter cannot be null. And I'm going to show you examples of that. This is a, a something similar. You can say, this function doesn't return. And the compiler can do extra checks and optimizations based on that. Uh, people use variable length arrays. Good, you shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, they were introduced in C99. They are now marked as deprecated in C11 um, and C18, and hopefully will be gone in C20. They now have an updated memory model that's very similar to the Java memory model. So we now have a well-defined memory model that's incredibly important for threading, especially. Um, again, we should be uh, using that. And it's also compatible with C++. And in general, there's just better compatibility with C++. They just try to align with languages if that matters for you. There's uh, C18. That's mainly a bug fix. There are really no new features in it. So if you didn't know about C18, that's OK. Then there's nothing really there except cleanup. C2X is the code name for the next release. Um, that's coming along uh, fairly quickly. They've already approved a lot of features. For example, uh, anyone in the financial industry here? Yeah, I know Constantine is. So um, how do you do calculations and money in C? With integers. With integers. And you usually have to manage. So first, first rule, never use flo floating point <coughs> numbers, right? Float double or numbers. Bad idea. Um, integers are OK, but you have to manage a lot of the semantics yourself. There's a new type, bi uh, binary floating point, uh, which implement uh, correct semantics for money. Um, and it's a, a, a gigantic uh, win for, especially if you're doing financial-based applications. There are other areas where it's useful too, but in the financial world, it's particularly important. Um, uh, I know like XLC supports this now. I'm not 100% sure if GCC or Clang. I don't think Clang does. GCC might have an implementation as well. Finally, they're going to get rid of KNR function declarations. Uh, finally, function declarations. <laughs> Please, yes. 
Uh, but maybe the most interesting thing, especially when I'm going to talk a little further, is they are now considering adding a new calling convention for functions where you can use the return, it not overload the return to both return a real value and indicate an error, which is what was commonly done in C now. Um, there is a number of different proposals on how to do this. This is very similar to what's happening in the C++ world where they're exploring a similar thing to replace exceptions or, or to, uh, as an adjunct to exceptions. This is, I would love, dearly love having this feature in the language. This would be one of the nicest things. So for any of you who go programmers, Okay, so if you know, if you don't go, this is a similar kind of concept. You can have multiple return values that traditionally use it, that one of the things you return is some kind of error indicator. Uh, this will be equivalent kind of thing. Um, there's better in, uh, integer constants. So if I have a const int in C and I initialize it, can I use it to declare the size of an array in C? Can I do that in C++? Yeah. No. Can I do that in C++? Yes. And that's because there's a different uh, interpretation of what is considered uh, an integer constant expression. And they're trying to align it more with C. This is one of the few places where you still need to use macros in C. It's just to size arrays. So this would be a wonderful thing to have. Uh, another thing they're uh, considering bringing in is the type deduction facility that C has. Uh, and any of you use the auto? I know people probably remember auto from KNR. Uh, auto in C++ has been repurposed. It's no longer the original meaning. It's now used for type deduction. Uh, they're considering bringing that and see that would be a game changer to make uh, declarations much, much simpler and more reliable. And anyone heard of the Annex K from C11? Yeah, that's right. Uh, that came from the Microsoft world. So it's stir, stir copy, for example. How many ways can you misuse stir copy? Lots and lots. And this was an attempt to make it safer, a safer stir copy. But it has had almost no adoption because of some major design errors, frankly. I, I don't recommend using it myself either. So they're considering dropping it okay. from the so language. Okay, so which language, which variant of the language are going to use? I would recommend at least using C99. Uh, it's, you can get C99 on every compiler. Um, we'll switch to guidelines. Um, uh, there are, uh, unlike um, the dark ages of C, there are really excellent coding guidelines. I put four different ones here. Uh, kind of in order of uh, uh, my preference. Uh, everyone's familiar with um, the MITRE uh, CWE uh, uh, vulnerabilities database. Uh, those are, you know, you always see um, uh, news articles coming back. This hacker took advantage of this vulnerability in C. Those get a number, and the number comes from the MITRE CWE database. Uh, they have um, um, let me actually jump to this. So here is an example of a whole list of vulnerabilities that C has. So uh, buffer underwrites, essentially a number flow uh, kind of thing. So everyone's familiar. They've itemized this. They have recommendations on how to prevent them. Fantastic information. Um, the one I like the best, and the one I would recommend everyone based on this is this is available free to anyone. You can contribute to the discussion of what kinds of features and they cross-reference all the other standards. And that's the SCI CERT guidelines. Are folks, are folks familiar with them? Okay. Uh, uh, Robert Secord 
who wrote uh, just a fantastic book. When we hire new developers, that's the one book I make everybody read. Um, and he is the head of the Cert C coding guidelines. It's organized like this. Um, there's rules and recommendations. I'll, I'll just go to one. And uh, so, so here's a here's an incredibly common error. You take the size of uh, of an array. So they give you the rule. They show you an example of bad code. An example of how to do it the right way. And an example of how to do it the right way. And then the last thing they do, and they have several examples, is they have a risk assessment. So when when you're uh, when you're maintaining an existing code base, say the Linux kernel or uh, some networking library, uh, you, if you run a static analysis tools on it, you wouldn't believe how many warnings and errors you're going to get. How do you begin to uh, tackle them? And they provide a mechanism of doing this by giving a risk assessment. They have a three-part thing. They give a severity. If this happens, how bad is it? Uh, like the, the engines fall off the plane. The guidance control system, the car, uh, shuts down. That'd be really, really severe. Uh, how likely is it to happen, and how much does it cost to fix it? And they give a score a priority and a level, and then you you can now rank your defects uh, based on this. And, and many of uh, the commercial tools, and they actually list out uh, what tool catches this. So you can see there are quite a few commercial tools. The one thing, and, and this is something I've been attempting to get to, is they focus on commercial tools and less on open source tools. I would love to see Here's the GCC flag to enable to catch this error. And you can. Uh, GCC is capable of catching many of these. And use that tool first. Uh, what was the book again? Program? Secure coding in, in the C programming language, something like that. Uh, go to the MITRE C uh, site. Uh, make sure you get the latest edition. They, they guide you through how uh, a, a, an attack uh, and, and a real attack, something that was actually used, how it's done, how do you get root from a buffer overflow. It shows how that's done, and then how do you protect against it. It's, it's just a fantastic book. Yeah, question. They skip some chapter numbers. Have you noticed? They're like one, two, three, four, five. Really? Uh, if you go to the to the main page. Main page. Right? Yeah. 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 Oh, 50, 51. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it was. Is it this space? They reserved it for. Uh, yeah, they don't have Mac OS here. And, uh, iOS. <laughs> so we need to get those in. Um, they do. They do. Their POSIX uh, rule set isn't great. They could do more. Windows is much weaker too. Unfortunately, they really should add a lot more uh, around there. Um, but in general, it's it's really comprehensive. And they have their wiki allows you to enter comments and say, you know, I strongly disagree with this. Here's a better way of of expressing this rule. Uh, Maestro is the, uh, motor, industry. Uh, Maestro is the uh, motor Industry Software Reliability Association. That's what that stands for. They uh, publish a very good standard for, and they have one both for C and C++. Uh, it's nowhere near as good as the SCI, and it costs uh, a bit of money, not, not a whole lot. The ISO is also problematic in that you have to pay a couple hundred dollars to actually get this back. Uh, for a company, it's it's cheap uh, insurance, so I would recommend doing that. Coding guidelines, try to adopt.
Okay, so uh, coding guidelines, try to adopt a coding guideline. Don't wing it yourself. There's been an enormous amount of research and effort put in. And I have to say, NIST, uh, the government sponsorship of these through NIST has been extraordinary. They've really done an excellent job to help uh, protect, uh, protect the U.S. market, at least. Uh, now I'm going to go through some things in C that are really problematic and I'm, I'm trying and I'm going to kind of go through this in order of what I found most problematic in both open source and commercial. And probably the number one thing is the error handling in C is just horrible. It's just atrocious. Um, C doesn't have any standard way of signaling that an error has. It doesn't have exceptions. It doesn't have any of the list-based kinds of approaches you can take. It doesn't have uh, go to uh, the Go uh, features of having multiple return types where you have a separate error channel. Um, uh, on top of that, there's nothing forcing the caller to pay attention to a possible error. And if, if there's, if I would say the number one cause of reliability and security issues is not checking the return uh, if a function succeeded properly after you called it. That happens all the time in um, both um, commercial and open source. And then the other part that if you do, if you are careful about error handling, it, the code becomes unbelievably verbose. So it's not like C++ or a language with exception handling, where you have a try, you have a whole bunch of function calls, and then a bunch of catches at the end. Instead, you end up with code that's inter uh, error handling intermingled with the main line uh, business functionality you're trying to implement. What about embedded environments where sometimes you don't want that done? Yes, that's right. And, and a, major com a major complaint about C++ is you have to buy into uh, the exception handle, which the uh, main problems there is you don't have a guarantee execution times and the overhead is just too high. So uh, I would say the majority of embedded people and game developers is another area and, and maybe a little more in the, you know, also in the high performance community, they don't use exception handling. So you haven't had kind of negative that's the beauty of it. That's, that's exactly right. So, so you have a trade-off here of what am I going to emphasize? Yeah, and I, I'm going to show you some techniques and try to get around that, but it's not pretty either, honestly. So here are some different alternatives and see, getting back to, okay, I don't have exceptions. What do I have? Uh, the, a very common paradigm in the C world, and, the, and you'll see this in both the C library and the POSIX library and the Windows library, is functions return error codes. Um, so um, uh, they're all over the place. Um, however, you'll often see that a function will overload what it's returning uh, a, a, real, a real useful value with some kind of way of signaling that an error has happened. Um, this is called, uh, this is sometimes referred to as overloading the, the return channel. Uh, I'll show you some examples of how hideously ugly that becomes in C in the standard library. Uh, the other common thing is to use a global um, variable. Error no is, is the most common one. Um, that's been uni uniformly panned as a bad idea now. Sounded like a good idea a long time ago. From a performance point of view, it's very problematic because you can't define pure functions all your functions have side effects. And, and because of that, the compiler can make certain optimizations. And then uh, some more uh, clever things that people have tried to do is to use callback functions. And the Annex K attempted to do that. And I think that's a major reason that Annex K was not adopted. People uniformly think that's a bad idea now, too. OK. so. Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to give some uh, 
uh, exam uh, some recommendations here and show you some code. Um, if I was to focus on one area to improve the security profile of my programs, it would be this. Uh, define a good error strategy. What, what is the model are you going to use? Are you always going to return an error? Are you going to designate a parameter as returning an error? Are you going to rely on error mode? Something like that. Just be pick one, be consistent, use it, uh, use it consistently. Uh, if you do decide to um, to uh, uh, return an error value, consider using the GCC warn unused result attribute. Folks, use that. Have, have you turned on enough of the, the warning level high enough in GCC that you get it triggered on the standard library? The, G, the glibc, almost all the functions that return an error code are now annotated with this. So you will get a compiler warning, which I highly recommend promoting to an error, saying uh, you ignored a possible error in this function. There's uh, certain idioms that have been uh, considered. Uh, one of maybe the most controversial but interesting one is the go-to idiom that the Linux kernel community and one fan. <laughs> Have folks seen that? How they do it? So what they're trying to do is implement RAII, resource acquisition is initialization from the C++ world where you get automatic cleanup. Um, by simulating it will go to. And I'll show more examples of that later. And the other big thing, you really think about what's an error and what's not. Th this is uh, that's probably more than we can do. So let me let me switch back. And okay. So here's an example. Okay. So here's an example. What if I have a string? Um, what if I have a string that I want to convert to uh, an integer? What do, what do folks use for that in C? A to I, right? Everyone uses A to I. Anyone use something else? Okay, what if I pass something that's not numeric? What does A to I do? It's undefined. Undefined behavior. You don't know what you get. You don't get an indication that it failed. It just returns you some integer and it keeps going. Um, so it, let me uh, let me show you that by. And this is an example of the disaster that error handling is in C. That's the, that's so the yes, that's the that's the recommended official standard library uh, approach. But I'm going to show you how hideous that is to do. But <laughs> let me compile it. Um, I got a little warning here, but let's ignore it. So I I'm going to run this now. It compiled, so no no problems, right? The code's going to work. Uh, I'm going to pass in ten. I think this takes two arguments. Um, okay, I got a deadly signal from the address sanitizer here. So let me uh, let me comment out that code just so we can see the ADI. Okay, by the way, uh, I'll, 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 I'll probably not going to have time to go through this. The address sanitizer shows exactly where the memory error happened. You don't have to hunt and peck any place. It is a hundred percent reliable. Well, I shouldn't say ninety, ninety-five percent reliable. It's incredible how good the address sanitizers are in GCC um, and Clang. Uh, so there's no reason you shouldn't be using them. Definitely, please. Okay, so I got it, so I'm going to run it now. So okay, so I got it, so I'm going to run it now. So it, it took 100, that worked. I'm going to pass ABC, 
And I got back zero. Oh, of course, I entered zero, right? <laughs> what if I gave it a really monstrously long number? Oh, it gives me minus one now. Okay, and, and your code just keeps going on. It thinks everything's okay. The alternative and the recommended approach and even the SEI recommendation is used is to replace A2L with A2I with STIRT to L and stir to LL and there's a number of variants to it. But the error handling is just atrocious because you get an integer back, but to figure out if an error occurred, you have to go through this machination. Uh, first you pass in a pointer uh, as one of the arguments. Check to see if it's at the beginning. If it is, then that's you didn't pass in a number, you passed in something else. Okay, that's good, I caught that, but that's not it. What if um, there was junk at the end of the number? So I started with one, two, three, four, and put an A in. So I said, well, I can't parse that, I'm gonna report that as a different error. Um, what if I passed in a really long number that can't be uh, held by a long? Well, the way you do that is check to see if the value is equal to either min or max, and then check that error node was set to E range. Now, who's going to do this? Well, the answer is nobody does this. It, it's, just, it's just horrendous to expect uh, to design a, a standard library, or maybe better to think of it, when you're designing an API for you, don't write code like this. That was this designed for someone who's <laughs> based on their Maybe, exactly. I, it, it's just astonishing. So, so this code that I'm showing you here that basically came from the SEI um, CERT coding guidelines. Nobody's going to do this. Or what you would do is write a wrapper around it and put a sensible error handling on this. Or, 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 <laughs> or a macro. Now you have two problems. <laughs> yeah, the C plus plus is much nicer. It's in sense S to I to throw exception. Yes. Um, here's um, the show a recommendation. Uh, here's what I would recommend is putting a wrapper around horrible functions like that. So folks are familiar with the system call in the C standard library. Um, it's just calling a function by launching another process. Anyone ever look at the how you signal errors in it? Again, it's, it's a nightmare. If, uh, this is what you have to do. Um, so I'm just going to jump to the implementation here. Okay, so you first call system. First check to see if minus one was returned. Um, uh, excuse me, if, if it, uh, minus one was not returned. Then at least uh, the system thinks it worked okay. Uh, you then need to see, get the exit status, and then see, and these are three different macros that are defined by the POSIX API. Exit status, exited, and signaled because while the program was processing, it might have gotten interrupted by a signal. And you need to know that because it actually didn't do what you asked it to do, but it returned anyway. So what do you get back? You don't get an error, you get this funky, crazy thing. So um, here's what I recommend, and this shows you how to use Doxygen as well to annotate code. We wrote a little wrapper function called QI system or coin, you know, put a prefix so it's not overloading. Um, and what it does, it takes a command to execute and now it returns an error mode T, which is a type that comes from the C11 standard. Anyone use error mode T? It's an int. That's all it is, but it's indicating that you're returning an error.